right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here with me today. Um, like you said, my name is Courtney Benjamin, and today I wanna talk to you all about what we as strength and conditioning professionals can do to prevent sudden death in sport. So I'm the Director of Communication and the Associate Director of Athlete Performance and Safety at the Corey Stringer Institute. For those of you who don't know, the Corey Stringer Institute is a not-for-profit organization that's housed in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Connecticut. And one of our main missions is to optimize safety and prevent sudden death in sport. Corey Stringer was an NFL football lineman who played for the Minnesota Vikings and unfortunately passed away of an exertional heat stroke during training camp back in 2001. His wife, Kelsey, his agent, Jimmy Gold, our CEO, Dr. Doug Casa, partnered with the NFL and created the Corey Stringer Institute to prevent tragedies such as this from happening. Since its founding, the Corey Stringer Institute is super excited about some of the new facilities that we've recently um, been, or that we've recently obtained. Um, the picture that you see up here is our brand new $1 million heat lab that opened this past September. And we bring a lot of elite athletes in to do sweat electrolyte -like testing, heat acclimatization, and much more research. Um, and so we're super excited about the facilities that we have here at UConn. We couldn't do what we do without our corporate partners, so I wanted to just briefly show you all the people that support all of our goals and missions at the Corey Stringer Institute. And I wanted to talk about, before I get more into the talk, about what our goal at the Corey Stringer Institute is. The athletes that you see here on the slides are all athletes that have unfortunately passed away during playing the sport that they love to play. Joseph Ciancola was a baseball player who died of an exertional heat stroke. Henry White was a basketball player who passed away playing basketball. And then most recently, Jordan McNair uh, passed away this past June um, while training for the University of Maryland for the upcoming football season. Another one of our goals is we want to do more of this. And what I mean by this is optimized performance. We are really fortunate at the Corey Stringer Institute because we get to work with a lot of elite athletes, triathletes, Ironmen, cross country teams, and many more to optimize their performance, especially in the heat. So some of you in the room may be thinking, well, we're strength and conditioning coaches. We work with our athletes and sure we care about their safety, but you know, we also have athletic trainers and sports medicine professionals. They can kind of help us out and be the ones that, you know, take care of most of this for us. So I did a little digging into some of the numbers to look at exactly what the athletic trainer ratio to student athlete population looks like. Um, and so for the 2016 to 2017 year, for high school sports, there were 7.96 million high school athletes. At the NCAA level in just 2018, there were 492,000 college athletes. Some of the most recent data that's come out of the Corey Stringer Institute Atlas Project shows that there's 7,200 approximately athletic trainers at the high school level, which means that there are 1,091 student athletes for every one athletic trainer at the high school level. And at the NCAA level, there's about 7,600 athletic trainers, which is a lot better, but still, there's 64 student athletes for every one athletic trainer. So I wanna encourage you all today to remember these numbers when we're moving forward in this talk and to remember that you as strength and conditioning professionals can and should be a part of, of creating a safe and um, optimal environment for your athletes to train in. So if any of you were in the talk earlier, we were, that was just in here before my talk, we, he was talking about value and how strength and conditioning coaches and people who work in this industry can create value in the sense of money, how much money we make um, as a professional in this industry. Some coaches find their value in the number of wins and losses that they have in their sport or how successful their athlete is on any given competition. Others find value in how they impact athletes outside of athletic events. So are the athletes that they're coaching becoming better people when they leave their sport or when they leave their coach at that particular school or university? 
What I want to encourage you all today to start to consider as a valuable asset to your profession is considering safety as a huge component of what can add value to your profession and to your career moving forward. So for the next couple of slides, you're going to see some dates on the top left corner that are going to seem arbitrary, but I think will make sense as we continue through the presentation. Um, so from 2000 to 2012, there were 21 NCAA football athletes that died during a conditioning session. And the three leading causes of death in those situations were exertional sickling, exertional heat stroke, and cardiac conditions. To give you a little breakdown of exactly where, where these deaths are and how they're distributed, um, exertional sickling accounted for approximately 42% of the deaths, followed very closely by cardiac, which accounts for about 41% of the deaths, and then exertional heat stroke accounts for about 17% of the deaths. I also want to define the two types of fatalities that can occur in sport. So you'll hear direct fatalities or indirect fatalities. Direct fatalities are those that are considered to be of contact. So when an athlete's tackled inappropriately or they hit their head on the ground, these results in deaths that are related to spinal cord injury and concussion. The types of deaths that I'm going to be focused on today in this talk are indirect fatalities, those such as cardiac deaths, exertional sickling, and exertional heat stroke. And what we know from the numbers that have come out of many research institutes that are looking at sudden death in sport is that indirect deaths are unfortunately on the rise, while direct deaths are fortunately getting better thanks to some rule implementations that have occurred recently. So to give you a little bit better breakdown as far as the trends that we're looking at, this graph is showing the number of deaths that have occurred in high school football from 1966 up until 2014. And what you can see is that the trend, thankfully, is extremely on the decline when we're looking at direct deaths. However, when we're looking at indirect deaths, such as those that I was mentioning earlier, unfortunately, the trend is on the rise. And so, what we need to do as strength and conditioning professionals, sports medicine professionals, and anyone who works with athletes is ask ourselves, well, what can we do to help prevent this trend from continuing? We want this trend to decline as well. So the next question that a lot of coaches or people who hear these statistics ask is, okay, so when are these deaths happening? What, what's the timeline look like for these deaths? Some research from the 2012 KSI registry shows that there are were about 260 deaths during athletic events, and those ranged from 7 to 88 years old, and that the deadliest months were August and July, and that those two months alone accounted for over 33% of all the deaths. However, those represent only 16% of the entire year. So if we simply focus on July and August alone, we can probably have a tremendous impact on the deaths that are occurring in those months. So again, looking at 2000 to 2012, 11 of the 21 deaths that occurred in sport occurred on days one and two, the first two days of a training session or a training period. So remember I said that the dates were gonna seem arbitrary, so what happened in 2012 was the National Athletic Training Association and the NSCA decided something's got to be done about these deaths that are happening. There's got to be something that we can do to help um, ed educate and acknowledge what can be improved upon to stop these deaths from occurring. So they collaborated and created this document, the Inter-Association Task Force for Preventing Sudden Death and Collegiate Conditioning Sessions Best Practices. This document was fortunately endorsed by all of these organizations that supported everything that was written in the document. One thing you'll notice about the slide previously and about the title of that document is that it says best practices. And one thing that the Corey Stringer Institute really tries to instill into people, anyone that we talk to about best practices, is that it means not waiting until it's mandated. Like the surfer that you see on the picture here, what we don't want to do is let the wave crash on top of us and we fall, meaning we let an athlete die in our hands but without trying to get ahead of the curve. We want to make these policies best practices into our programs now before we ever have an athlete die on our watch. 
So what we know since 2012, since the release of this document, is that policy changes have helped. From the NCCSIR in 2016, we know that exertional sickling-related fatalities have decreased and that there's only been two August deaths since the policies have been implemented. When we look more specifically at the exertional heat stroke deaths alone, what you can see on the figure here is the red represents the NCAA sports and the stripes represents high school sports. The left two bars are demonstrating the number of deaths prior to policy adoption and then the ones on the right are after policy adoption. So clearly the, the policy adoption helps for exertional heat stroke. So what about strength and conditioning sessions? Since 2012, in all sports of all levels, from, and this, this is from 2014 to 2015, there's been 48 indirect fatalities and eight of them have occurred in strength and conditioning sessions. In football alone in 2015, 10 of the indirect fatalities, out of the 10 indirect fatalities, six occurred in strength and conditioning sessions. So before we go any further, can I just get a show of hands of who is familiar with this document? I know some people in the room were actually on the document. Awesome. And then can I get a show of hands of who have never seen it? And it's totally fine if you haven't. I didn't see it before I started working at KSI. Okay, cool. So for those of you who have seen the document, um, the purpose of the rest of the talk today is to kind of provide some reminders, refreshers, and updated statistics related to the best practices that are written on this document. And for those of you who haven't seen it, the purpose of the rest of this talk today is to go through the 10 best practices for how we can make strength and conditioning sessions safer for our athletes. So the first recommendation is related to progressive acclimatization is the cornerstone of safety. What we know is that the first seven to 10 days of any, new of any new conditioning session or program should be considered transitional periods. This includes coming back from Christmas break, coming back from spring break, uh, any long breaks that an athlete had after an injury, preseason. Any of those times should be taken into special consideration when introducing an athlete to a program. And these progressions should entail all areas of strength and conditioning. The progressions, there should be a gradual progression in intensity, duration, volume, and intensity. When we look at work to rest ratios, four to one seems to be a good place to start, especially when we're talking about indoor training, so sports such as basketball that may not train out in the heat. So an example of this would mean you have 20 minutes of an athlete training and you give them five minutes off to recover or get water in between the sessions. However, when the heat is involved and athletes are outside training in really oppressive weather, you might want to consider a work to rest ratio of two to one. So giving the athletes longer time to rehydrate and recover in between putting them out in their conditioning sessions. Also, these training programs should be individualized. Um, like you said in the introduction, I played soccer at the University of West Florida. Me and some of my teammates that were from Florida, we were very used to training in the heat right before preseason. So when we were starting preseason, we were ready to go. We were totally heat acclimatized. We had been training in the heat. However, we had a couple of athletes that I played with that were from Iceland. They were training in completely different environmental conditions than what they came into during preseason in the panhandle of Florida. So in cases like that, what the Corey Stringer Institute in this document recommends is that those athletes get treated a little differently as far as getting them used to training in the heat compared to those of us that were already there acclimatized to the heat. So does this recommendation work? In 2003, the NCAA adopted a heat acclimatization policy and prior to 2003, there was about one death every year. And since 2003, there was only, there's only been two total deaths. So I would say, yeah, it probably does work. And high school is showing some really promising data with this as well, so stay tuned for that. Um, we'll be posting some stuff about that shortly on KSI's website. When we look at um, specifically exertional heat stroke deaths that have happened since acclimatization guidelines have been put in place, what you see on the map here is the black dots represent all of the deaths that have occurred. 
And the states that you see highlighted in red are the ones that meet the minimum best practice requirements for feed acclimatization. And so for some of you in the back, it may be a little hard to see, but basically what this map is showing is that no deaths have occurred in states that meet the minimum best, best practices for heat acclimatization. I know all of you are strength and conditioning professionals and interested in performance, so I wanted to throw a little bit of information about performance and how heat acclimatization can also help aid in performance. So what we know about heat acclimatization is that the first seven days especially are crucial. We know that after seven days of exposing your athletes to heat, their heart rate will decrease, their plasma volume will expand, their rectal temperature will decrease, their rating of perceived exertion or how hard they felt their workout was will decrease, and also their renal sodium and chloride concentration will go down. So not only will heat acclimatization help optimize your athlete's safety, but it will also help improve their performance in the sport that you're trying to help them improve as well. So this um, table is also on our website if you want it for reference, but I just quickly want to go through the different areas of practice modification. This guideline is, or these, this table, like I said, um, is on our website, but it goes through mainly focusing on football and the areas of practice modification that can be done in football. However, I also can say from someone who, like I said, plays soccer and is familiar with other team sports, you can just remove some of the information such as the contact and um, equipment and the same guidelines can apply for those sports as well. So when we're looking at the area of practice modification is what you're gonna see on the top and then the next two columns are gonna re represent the practice days, so one through five and then days six through 14 are on the far column. So the number of practices that are recommended to be on days one through five are one. We recommend for heat acclimatization especially, there should never be more than one practice a day on the first five days of a conditioning period. On days six through 14, two days are permitted. However, the best practice is that only every other day is a two a day. This gives the athlete optimal time to recover, rehydrate, and get ready for the next session that they're gonna have the following day. In regards to equipment, helmets only are recommended for day one and two. Shoulder pads can be added on days three and five, and then on days six through 14, you can go full equipment. This allows the athlete, again, time to acclimatize and get some of those physiological changes that are going to happen with training in the heat. As far as the maximum duration of a single practice, it's recommended that on days one through five, a maximum time that anyone should be practicing is three hours at most. And that three hours is the maximum time on day six through uh, 14 as well, um, including, and that a total of five hours should be there for the second practice or the two a day. So if the one practice is three hours, the next practice should be no more than two. And then for Walkthrough, there should be no, the walkthrough should last no more than one hour, and it should be separated from the previous practice that was done outside by at least three hours. And this will again allow the athlete time to cool off, rehydrate, and get ready for the walkthrough and the practice they're going to have out in the heat. And then for contact, you guys can read those through on your own since this is the, not the purpose of this um, talk, but that is there for your reference. So I'm gonna go through, as I go through these different policies, you'll see these self-checks here, and I put these up here just to trigger some thoughts and questions about your program and the way that you work with your athletes to ask yourself if you're following these best practice guidelines. So the first self-check about this first policy is, do I intentionally program my workouts for heat and exercise acclimatization? Are my athletes always supervised by a certified strength and conditioning coach? And do I consider individual athlete needs when I write my programs, especially focused on the heat? So the next recommendation is related to introducing new conditioning activities gradually. New exercise, as many of us in the room are already aware, should be introduced in a gradual fashion by a qualified strength and conditioning coach. This is particularly important at the beginning of a conditioning session, such as those we were talking about earlier, preseason, 
Um, a freshman athlete coming in that's never lifted a weight in their life, has never participated in college sports and things of that nature. And what the data shows in regards to this guideline, like we talked about a few slides ago, there's been 21 deaths in NCAA sports, or in NCAA football players, and those are the leading causes. 11 of those occurred on days one and two, but 16 of 21 occurred during transition period. So this shouldn't just be considered for preseason. This should also be considered for when an athlete's coming back from an injury, or if the athlete has never participated in this type of training before. This can help eliminate some of these deaths that we're seeing during these transitional periods. It's staggering when you think that just five weeks of the year accounted for over 75% of the deaths. So if we can make modifications to our training in just these five weeks, think of the difference we can make for these athletes. So the self-check for this guideline is, do I introduce new activities gradually, especially during transition periods? So the third recommendation from the document is do not use exercise and conditioning activities as punishment. The story I wanna tell you about related to this guideline is one of a college basketball player who was a freshman, um, showed up to a conditioning session the first day he'd ever been on the college campus a few minutes late because he couldn't find where he was going. Um, the coach at the time wanted to instill discipline, let the players know that they can't be late, they're not allowed to be late to their sessions. So the coach decided to have the athlete and some of his teammates who were also late go out and run a five mile run, oh, granted these are basketball players, five mile run in 95 degree weather at about 30 to 50% humidity and 135 degrees Fahrenheit blacktop. So they were running on concrete. Um, they weren't allowed to have water because the coach, again, wanted to make sure the athletes knew that they weren't allowed to be late. Um, and the athletic trainer was not aware of the run and was not there um, during this run. Unfortunately, the athlete I t mentioned a second ago collapsed, had an exertional heat stroke. There was no one there to, to treat him or provide proper care for him. And unfortunately, that athlete later passed away from an exertional heat stroke. Um, and the family uh, sued the university for the athlete's death and the university had to pay out $3 million for negligence for that athlete. So that's just one example of uh, why this guideline was recommended in this document. So the self-check for this guideline is, do I have precautions in place to ensure the safety of my athletes? Just really quick, because I know that uh, exertional rhabdomyolysis is a pretty hot topic right now um, with a lot of the cases that we've seen. I'm not sure how many of you saw this document that came out by Dr. Eichner in May of this year, but it was basically a review of a lot of the exertional rhabdomyolysis cases that have happened over the years. Um, and a colleague of mine helped me put this table together from, the, from that document. And I just wanted to quickly point out that if those first three guidelines alone, we're, there's 10 total, but if just those first three guidelines had been followed, there's a good chance that none of these cases of exertional rhabdomyolysis would have happened because if you can see here, there are, all of them were strength and conditioning sessions, most of them were strength and conditioning sessions, one of them was a punishment run and all of them that we are aware of occurred after a break. So there was no slow or gradual introduction into the workout. And so the finding and the main take home from this document was that the main cause of exertional rhabdomyolysis is from novel overexertion. Too much, too soon, too fast. So the next recommendation from the document is proper education, experience, and credentialing of strength and conditioning coaches. This talk, how many of you were um, at the opening ceremonies this morning? Okay, good. So this uh, guideline seems to fit perfectly with what um, the new announcement was about the NSCA adopting the new policies for certified strength and conditioning specialists, because that's what has been recommended in this document um, and what a lot of professionals in this field think is gonna be the next step in pushing our field forward. So. Um, the recommendation in the document back in 2012 was the need to establish an accredited curriculum for entry-level programs, and 
I'm really excited that that's going to be the next step for the NSCA moving forward. Um, a portion of the coursework for these programs should be focused on health and safety and preventing sudden death in sport. Um, a lot of times I feel strength and conditioning coaches and professionals, we focus so much on, on performance because that's what we all got into this profession to do, right? We want to help our athletes achieve the optimal performance that they possibly can. But in order to do that, the first step in that is keeping them safe and keeping them here. So that part of the strength and conditioning programs is crucial to the performance part and should even come before that. And then also continuing education and continually updating yourself and the, your colleagues that you work with on how we can help improve the safety of our athletes is going to be crucial in continuing to push this uh, field forward. Additionally to education, strength and conditioning coaches should also be mentored by people who understand and are aware of these safety guidelines. These uh, mentors can help strength and conditioning coaches understand the importance of health and safety for their programs. And then as many of us in the room are already aware and have already done, strength and conditioning coaches should be required to pass a certification exam by an accredited agency. Additionally, the document recommends that strength and conditioning coaches should document that they understand these safety, health and safety aspects and that they know um, the background, they have the background and knowledge to actually apply them into their environment and into their sport. And then most of us in the room, if, you're, if you have your CSES or have any certification from this organizing body, you'll have your CPR, first aid and AED certification. So the self-check for this guideline is, have I received any education relating to preventing sudden death in sport? And if you haven't, I would strongly recommend visiting KSI's website or reaching out to anyone or in anything that you could possibly think of to educate yourself on what you can do to prevent sudden death in sport for your athlete. And then the other one is, am I certified by accredited organization? So the next recommendation is to provide appropriate medical coverage. This topic can be a little sticky, I know, because sometimes we're just put in an environment where we don't have access to athletic trainers or sports medicine professionals. But the best practice is to always have these uh, individuals in place to help you ensure that your athletes are safe. So a strength and conditioning coach should have access and be prepared to deliver CPR in the need of an athlete collapsing. Additionally, the, an athletic trainer or a team physician should be present during high risk conditioning sessions, which would be considered especially at the beginning of a, of a period of um, training, such as preseason or after injury. An athletic trainer also should be at least aware of the, a low risk conditioning activity that may be occurring, even if they can't always be there with you, if you have access to an athletic trainer and you know that you're gonna be doing a conditioning session, at least just letting them know that you're gonna be out there so they can be prepared in case something were to happen. That's the, definitely the next step to take. Um, and then the institution that you work for should determine the need for medical coverage. I highly encourage all of you, if any, if any of you in the room don't have access to an athletic trainer, I would highly encourage you when you go back to wherever you work or whoever you work for to really push for at least getting someone there that can help be your medical liaison and your medical um, partner in helping make sure that your performance, your athletes are safe for their performance. So the self-check for this guideline is, am I CPR certified? Do I always plan ahead to have appropriate medical coverage at high-risk sessions? And is there an AT or sports medicine professional close by during low-risk sessions? So the next recommendation is related to the development and practice of emergency action plans. All strength and conditioning venues should have emergency action plans posted. If you don't have one, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to get one um, and to make one. Sit down with your sports medicine team, your athletic trainers, team physicians, anyone that you can that could help you make an emergency action plan, I would get one. Um, 
a coach, the sport coach, not just a strength and conditioning coach, but also the, the coach, the football coach, the soccer coach, any coach that you work with should also be aware and knowledgeable of this emergency action plan and where to find it in case of an emergency. I'm not going to go through these components today, but it's here for your reference. It's also on KSI's website. If you don't have an emergency action plan and would like to make one, these are the 12 components. You can literally walk through these 12 components and by the end of it, you will have an emergency action plan that should have all of your bases covered for any emergent situation that could happen um, with your athletes. So the self-check for this um, policy or this recommendation is, do I have an updated emergency action plan? And do I review and rehearse the emergency action plan annually? And is the coach I work for familiar with the emergency action plan? So the next recommendation is to, surrounding you being cognizant of medical conditions surrounding your athletes. So the top three leading causes of death that we touched on earlier were exertional sickling episodes, cardiac conditions, and exertional heat stroke. All of you in the room, I hope that after today you are familiar with them and I also hope that you are educated and are willing to share these, um, the, the, uh, the symptoms related to these illnesses with your colleagues and with the people that you work with. So not only you, but everyone that is around you is aware of what to look for with these, or with these illnesses. So, the document recommends that organizing and credentialing bodies also continue to educate anyone who's affiliated with these athletes on these specific medical conditions. If you don't know anything about any of them, that's totally fine. You should check out the NATA position statements to get a good background on these different illnesses and what to look for with them. Um, today, I'm going to quickly go through the top three that we talked about today and some, some things that you can use in your practice moving forward to be aware of them. So the first one is sickle cell trait. Um, most athletes nowadays are aware of their sickle cell trait status and if they have it, but strength and conditioning coaches and people who work with these athletes on a daily basis should also be aware of their status because you can help educate the athlete and also help encourage them to take breaks when they need. If you're seeing signs and symptoms, such as an athlete who's stumbling, who normally doesn't, or who just doesn't look right that day, you can help encourage them to sit out, take breaks, and get water when they need to prevent that exertional sickling episode from happening. Additionally, encouraging the athlete and yourself and the athletic trainer and everyone who's involved to continually get educated on the most updated findings and policies related to exertional sickling can really help prevent some of these catastrophes that we've seen happen with related to this trait. So the next um, illness is exertional heat stroke. That's one of the ones that the Corey Stringer Institute has focused heavily on uh, researching. And what we know about exertional heat stroke is that it is 100% survivable, survivable when treated appropriately. On the next slide, you'll see an infographic that I think explains it a little more clearly, but the big thing is to have a cooling plan. Know what to do when an athlete is suffering from an exertional heat stroke. Additionally, as strength and conditioning professionals, you can help prevent the exertional heat stroke from ever happening by adopting some of those heat acclimatization policies that we talked about earlier in the session from the first guideline. Additionally, the supervising staff, not only you, but also your sport coaches, should be aware of the heat acclimatization policies that can help prevent these, these episodes from ever happening in the first place. So a document that was released um, a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, by one of our colleagues at KSI went over the entire treatment plan for someone who's suffering from an exertional heat stroke. We made this infographic at KSI, and if you want to check out the paper, you can just scan the little barcode that's down at the bottom of this presentation. Um, but basically what the take home from this paper is, is that exertional heat stroke is 100% survivable if you race, meaning you recognize the exertional heat stroke, you assess it appropriately using rectal thermometry, the athlete is submerged in cold water until they're cooled, and then they're sent for emergent care. We know that if this procedure is followed, no one will ever, no one has died under this exact treatment protocol. And then the last one is cardiac conditions. 
Many of you, or most of you, are probably AED and CPR certified. And what we have all learned in these classes is that quick response is key to the survivability of any cardiac condition. So having a plan in place, always having, having an AED out with you, even if your athletic trainer can't come out to a session with you, bringing an AED out with you so if someone does collapse and they are having a cardiac episode, you're able to put the AED on them and pr start providing CPR without having to call an ambulance and wait because every time that ticks after an athlete co collapses is detrimental to their um, ability to survive after that event. So for more information, this is a really awesome table. If you aren't familiar with some of these conditions and you just want the basics of, well, what should I look for in these events um, and how can I kind of know how to distinguish one from another, I would highly encourage you to take a look at this table or this paper to get a good idea of some of the symptoms related to some of these conditions that we've talked about today. So the self-check for this recommendation is, am I aware of medical conditions that can affect the performance of my athletes? And do I know the signs and symptoms of common medical conditions that can be related to indirect exercise collapse? So the next recommendation is related to administering strength and conditioning programs. The document recommends that athletic departments, not sport coaches, be responsible for the supervision of strength and conditioning coaches, and that the strength and conditioning coach and athletic trainer should work hand in hand. They should be constantly communicating, constantly working together, knowing what medical conditions are going on from the strength and conditioning perspective. The athletic trainer should know about what training plan the strength and conditioning coaches have. And those two together can really work to, to provide the best opportunity and the best program for the athletes to perform better and stay safe doing the sport that they love. The document recommends that the strength and conditioning staff and the medical staff meet at the beginning of every season um, to go over health and safety concerns as well as for the strength and conditioning coach to let the sports medicine staff know what they plan on doing so that those individuals can provide feedback related to that athlete that may have sickle cell trait or an athlete that perhaps had an exertional heat stroke a few years before and things of that nature. So the strength and conditioning professional can also be looking out for those signs and symptoms for those individuals. And then the emergency action plan could also be reviewed at the time of this meeting. So the self-check for this is who is my boss and do I work with athletic trainers and sports medicine professionals to discuss health and safety concerns at the beginning of each year. The next recommendation is related to partnership of recognized professional organizations. Key organizations should establish a partnership to periodically review and rehearse and disseminate best practices related to preventing sudden death in sport. The research is constantly updating and changing and we're learning so much more about preventing sudden death in sport and you should definitely follow and keep up with the changes that are happening in this world because you want to be on the forefront of knowing about how to help your athletes stay safe doing their sport. So the self-check for this is are the organizations I'm a part of encouraging best practices and are the organizations I look to for resources continuously updating their best practices. And then the last recommendation from the document is related to adequate continuing education for the entire coaching and medical teams. So strength and conditioning coaches, sport coaches, athletic trainers, team physicians, and anyone who works on a daily basis with the athletes should be able to demonstrate that they know about preventing sudden death in sport. They should demonstrate the knowledge behind all of the things that we've talked about today and be able to apply those to their programs. Each reporting period should require an emergency care and preventing sudden death component, meaning that every single reporting period, strength and conditioning coaches should be able to demonstrate that they know about preventing sudden death in sport. So the self-check for this recommendation is, do I, have to period, do I have to periodically demonstrate my knowledge related to preventing sudden death in sport? So now that we've gone through all of these best practice recommendations, as strength and conditioning professionals, what's next? I would go through these documents, or through this document and others that are related to this document, and determine 
if you can improve upon any of these recommendations. Establish if you are not doing any of these recommendations or these recommendations are not part of your daily practice as a strength and conditioning coach, what can you do to improve upon that? And then also discuss the changes that you think you might want to make with your athletic trainer or a sports medicine professional and get their feedback and opinion on it as well. And then just make the changes. So for those of you who might not be familiar, the Corey Stringer Institute works closely with the National Center for Catastrophic Sport Injury Research, the NCCSIR. Um, and what this organization basically is, is a reporting system for any catastrophic injury that occurs in sports. This doesn't just involve fatalities. This also involves survive sto survival stories. So if any of you are aware of or you know of any um, things like what we've talked about today that have happened, I would encourage you to visit this website and register um, anything that you know about to this website to continue research and help us to continue advocating for making sports safer. So the big take home from the message today is you can maximize your value and your athlete's performance by ensuring the safety of your program. Please consider following KSI on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we're continually posting things about sudden death in sport and also about some of the performance testing and things we're doing in our research lab. Thank you. <laughs>